So in case you don't know who I am, I'm Barr Von Osen from Rutgers University Office of Advanced Research Computing, which is uh, an office at Rutgers University that was spearheaded by Manish Parashar. So thank you, Manish, uh, for putting it together <laughs> um, and giving me this opportunity. And uh, we're doing a lot of very exciting things at, at Rutgers. And so this session is uh, cloud successes and challenge, well actually, I think it said failures in the, in the program, and, and I thought that was a little bit harsh, so I changed it to challenges, public and private. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, you know, with, with Google Cloud and, and on the Rutgers campus, and uh, from a service provider perspective, a campus service provider's uh, perspective, Alex Feltis, who's at Clemson University, is going to follow up and, and give a researcher's perspective on, on cloud services. So we figured that it would, we'd complement each other. Alex and I go way back because I worked at Clemson University for 17 years and worked very closely, uh, reported to Jim Bottom, so um, uh, know a lot of you. Uh, so anyway, um, to kick this off, so cloud services, um, for me it's you know commercial cloud and then uh, campus level cloud infrastructure. And uh, just working very closely with the research community, these are just some uh, findings or observations that I've had, um, at least at Rutgers University and even at Clemson. Um, you know, people are, are talking about the cloud, but uh, right now there's not really a large demand for it. I'm, I'm talking about commercial cloud. Um, you know, people come to us and ask questions and, um, uh, there is interest, and, and we're trying to set up programs to educate people on how to, how to uh, use cloud services, and, and we're becoming more and more the go-to place on the, on the university, at the university uh, to help people get access to them. Um, the, the, the challenge is, and, um, and, and this is what I'm finding with a lot of the, the researchers, is that uh, when they go to you know, the Amazon website or the Google website or um, Azure, uh, and they, it's a bit overwhelming for them, and so uh, they tend to, to shy away from it, and so having a group like ours help them sort of navigate through that is extremely uh, useful. Uh, having a, an effective education, outreach, and training uh, program is essential to help people make that transition, um, because as we're finding, we, we set up these sessions all the time, we're finding that there is the interest, and people are curious about it, but they're not sure what it means for them. And so, um, but the sessions do fill up very quickly, um, and we, we, we do run them all the time, but we still haven't seen that uptick in people using the services. Um, and, and the other thing that we love and take advantage of are the cloud service providers uh, do offer train-to-trainer sessions. They will partner with us on training activities. And so we, uh, we leverage that quite a bit uh, to try and introduce uh, cloud services. So I'm a great believer in building out um, hybrid solutions. I, I, we can handle stuff on-prem, but not everything. And so um, the, the ultimate uh, design is going to be a combination of all of this. So you know, in my mind, it's a, it's a hybrid or a hyper-converged environment which includes campus cloud, commercial cloud, and national resources and services. So, um, you know, the PRP, NRP, I mean, makes a lot of sense to me uh, that, that we're, we're talking about this because that really is the future. And, and so I'm, I'm using that um, approach at Rutgers as we're building out our services. So uh, just to give you an idea, um, you know, the Rutgers Federated Computing, so th this is our campus cloud, and we got an NSF CC Star grant, and so that allowed us to build out 100 gig network connectivity between uh, the three Rutgers campuses. And um, so I, I, I should stress that you know, Rutgers Newark thinks of itself as a separate university, Rutgers New Brunswick thinks of itself as a separate university, and Rutgers Camden, um, even though the Rutgers umbrella is overarching, um, you know, they, they are looking for their own services, and I saw the opportunity to build out distributed computing across uh, the state of New Jersey using the funding from the, the CC Star grant. And, um, and it's enabled us to uh, build what I call a local research platform uh, and, and uh, to, to best serve the research that's going on uh, at the university. 
And um, at the same time that we were building this out, Slurm came out with uh, the Federation capabilities in the scheduler. And so even though we have three separate systems on, on the different campuses, um, they're all federated and uh, it's completely policy driven. So the Newark campus has very different policies than the Camden campus and the New Brunswick campus. And so um, we can you know, change those as, as needed. And um, a user coming into our system sees it as a single resource. So they log in and when they submit um, their job, then it could land on any of the resources. And again, it just depends upon the policies. And, um, and then we have to think in terms of what's, what we do with the network, the data, and so we're working with all these companies on trying to handle the data movement, the caching, and, and trying to figure out how, how uh, to give people access. And so we've got a couple of companies that are, um, you know, deployed object store in our environment to test it out and see um, how it might uh, solve some of our problems. Uh, we've got GPFS in there. So we've got all these different um, uh, test beds going on in this environment to explore different ways of solving some of these problems. And um, so, so like I said, we had Slurm. We're looking at Kubernetes for all our containerization of workflows. Uh, we're working uh, also with Singularity. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, we've, we've got uh, you know, data transfer nodes between all the campuses. So, um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's been quite an adventure uh, getting there and building this out, but uh, this has led actually to a broader discussion, and so Wendy talked about this earlier today with the Eastern Regional Network. Um, we, um, oh, before I jump into that part, um, I should mention that um, we are tying uh, Google Cloud services directly into our on-campus uh, 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 resources. So through that Slurm Federation, we can now fire up an instance in Google Cloud, and we could easily do that in Azure or AWS. We've just been working very closely with Google on this, um, where we can uh, federate it with our on-prem resources. So if a researcher comes to us and says, um, so for example, we have a researcher who got a big data grant, and she's got you know, multiple credits for Google Cloud. So she can now log on to our system. We have a special queue for her. She submits and it just lands in the cloud for her. And so she didn't even have to think about it. So she can now choose which queue she wants, whether it's on-prem or the cloud. And we're trying to, to set it up in such a way that it's very simple for her to be able to do this stuff. And so, um, so we, we uh, worked very closely with SCEDMD and Google on this. And then SCEDMD included the cloud bursting capabilities in their scheduler, which is now available to everybody. So the newest version has this built in. And um, you know, they're working on trying to get it where uh, if a user who has Google credits um, um, submits a job, and the, it'll automatically fire up the resources in Google Cloud. So we don't have to have stuff just running there listening to the, the, uh, uh, to, to the job queue. So, um, so anyway, it's, it's very interesting as, as we're doing this. And so, um, so word got out about what we were doing, and so a year ago, uh, we, several of us, Wendy, uh, John Goodhue, uh, Dave Marble, and uh, Chris Sador, uh, probably, and myself, we sat down and, and talked about what could we be doing on the East Coast, because you know, the East Coast, the states are very close together. Um, we've got multiple regional network providers that we have to work with, and, and so, by creating these uh, cross-institutional uh, 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 collaborations, we have to navigate through um, a, a lot of different layers in order to, to make it happen. And so we thought that we should try and do something. And so that came into uh, play with the uh, Eastern Regional Network proof of concept. And the idea, and again, it was inspired by the PRP. Uh, so, so we love what you're doing and we, wanted to see how it might work on the East Coast, which is a little bit different than the West Coast, and uh, try and copy a lot of what you're doing. Um, but we, tr we took the, uh, the, the um, environment at Rutgers and thought, okay, what happens if we include another campus or you know, multiple campuses and start doing the federation? And so that turned out to be the, the proof of concept. So, um, so we're going through this now. We've got multiple campuses that are standing up services and federating with us, and um, you know, we're talking with the research community and trying to 
to, to build this out. Uh, so here's a, a graphic of uh, what we're trying to do. So, uh, you know, multiple campuses, it includes uh, several network, uh, regional network providers, and getting everybody in the same room and talking has been extremely exciting because, um, you know, we all go to these conferences and we talk about, oh, yeah, we should be sharing, we should be doing this, and, you know, uh, look at what the Pacific Research Platform's doing, we should be doing something like that, too. And, and so just the energy in the room and, and, and the willingness to have these conversations has been, has been uh, uh, phenomenal. And so just to give you an idea of, of uh, you know, the different groups that are involved in this, so in New Jersey, it's Rutgers, NJ Edge, NJIT, New York, we had NYSERNET, uh, Buffalo and Syracuse, so the asterisk means that they've actually started uh, building out a service or standing, uh, already have one up and we're testing uh, Ocean uh, with Brown University, Kimber, Penn State and Bucknell, Massachusetts Green uh, High Performance Computing Center, University of Massachusetts, Boston University, uh, we've included them on our, uh, uh, our, our regular calls, uh, Maine and New Hampshire, Delaware and Connecticut, and uh, of course Internet2 is a, a partner on this. So um, a lot of interest uh, in what we're doing, and uh, people are contacting me all the time about how they can participate in this. And uh, you know, through uh, the National Research Platform uh, proof of concept, uh, we've got a lot of science drivers that could easily take advantage of that. And um, so uh, glad to have that discussion. Um, so the deliverables for this uh, project, so building out this campus level cloud infrastructure, it's the federated HPC resources based on what we're doing at Rutgers, um, building out a recipe that each site, so we've got a set of instructions in GitHub now that, um, and, and I should point out the reason we chose Slurm is because uh, many of the universities in the region and across the nation are using Slurm for their schedulers. And if you upgrade to uh, the latest version, it includes the cloud bursting technologies plus the federation. And so we thought that this would be an easy entry point. Um, you know, there's still a lot of issues that have to be worked through, but it just seemed like a great starting point for this project. Um, but Kubernetes, again, we're, we're all looking at Kubernetes and, and trying to figure out how that fits in here. So, um, and then, you know, putting together a report on what we're doing and submitting proposals to help try and get funding for what we're doing. So a lot of excitement uh, growing on, on the East Coast. Um, and just a list of the science drivers, so, um, which is the most important piece, right? Because we're trying to design a system that supports uh, the research. And just going around to all of our different campuses and having conversations, we got a lot of people that were really excited about what we were trying to do because, you know, the first thing we asked them was, who are you trying to collaborate and what are your pain points? And, um, and so that's what we're focusing on, is trying to remove some of those pain points. And when we talk to them about it, they're saying, if you can do that, we're all in. And so these are just some of the uh, different groups at our universities that we talked to about this and uh, got buy-in. And, and so you know, we've been working on a grant proposal and we've got letters of support. And in fact, we ended up with more science drivers than, uh, than we had room for. Um, but uh, so anyway, it's just, it's really exciting to see not only the people that are building out the infrastructure, but the research community uh, interested in what we're doing. Um, and then we're trying to, you know, make it pretty easy for people to jump on board and, and be a part of it. But of course, the Perf's own RP, so as, as Wendy showed, we're, we're already building that out. Um, so the challenges, questions on what we're doing. So, um, so as everyone knows, this becomes a social experiment, right? So. Uh, a lot of times the equipment's not that challenging. I mean, we can all kind of work, but it, it's, it's the people part that makes it really interesting and, and fun. And uh, just as far as questions that we're trying to answer, you know, how do we make this work for a broader set of campuses? What are the operational pain points that we're all facing with and how do we overcome them? What is the multi-organizational business model that can support production? So we're, it's a proof of concept. So what does it mean to sustain it, move it into our production infrastructure? Um, coordinating investments uh, across uh, um, all the campuses, and um, and how do we scale it without becoming overwhelmed with what we're doing? So, um, so there's a lot going on, and uh, a lot that we're thinking about. 
Um, and we're supposed to also talk about challenges with using commercial cloud. So, um, so many universities are still charging overhead on it, and that's that's uh, that's you know not really uh, uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know researcher sees that and they're thinking you know I I can put that money somewhere else, <laughs> and uh, so we're all having discussions about this, and we're saying look the the cloud services they're not sitting on campus, and so why are you charging overhead? But anyway. They still do, and we're all arguing about it, but uh, and still, until that gets settled, um, uh, that's, that's one of the biggest uh, challenges that we're faced with right now. The pricing model. So I had this conversation with uh, all the cloud providers. For, for the research community, um, it's really challenging, and, and I keep reminding them that we are such a small slice of their business, that, but we could offer so much back in, you know, if they would just you know, work with us on the pricing. And I think that whole spot pricing model is just crazy, but uh, that's me. Um, but, I, you know, I hear other people uh, complaining about that too. Um, the other one, central IT often tries to control access. I don't know if others have experienced this, but, you know, they have the security and billing fears, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, we've had to work through that because I, I sit down with them and I say, you know, this is not going to work for the research community. You can't put all these roadblocks in there. And so luckily they handed over the whole research component of the university's cloud services to us so we can actually provision services and work with people and f we fill out all the forms for the researchers so we try and minimize that as much as possible. Uh, data access storage, you know, a lot of people are talking about that. Um, as I mentioned before, researchers find the cloud environment intimidating, hard to navigate. Um, and this uh, second to last bullet, who owns the data? That's been a, actually a big conversation on our campus recently because, um, you know, I, I've, I've sat in um, uh, meetings where, you know, people were saying, well, the university owns the data. And I'm saying, well, what if we're collaborating with somebody at another university and we're sharing the data? You know, so then they say, well, we don't like you because you keep bringing up all these counter arguments to what we're <laughs> trying to do. <laughs> um, but this is stuff that they have to think about, right? So they can't have these sweeping generalizations about who owns the data. So I, I, uh, I jump on that all the time. And, and the last one was uh, I was on the plane uh, flying here yesterday and I wanted to edit these slides and I couldn't because my PowerPoint uh, was trying to connect to the, <laughs> the Office 365 service, came back and said I, I wasn't activated and I could not edit the document. <laughs> so anyway, so that's a problem. <laughs> um, so I had to open it up in Keynote, so thankfully I was able to do some editing, but it, it still, it just amazed me that I'm, I'm fighting this. Um, and the last thing is there have been several uh, meetings, uh, NSF funded, uh, workshops and um, one uh, uh, reports have come out of there that are very helpful and, and, and something to th think about. So recommendations to NSF and then recommendations to the community. So um, I sat on both of those committees and we had you know pretty intense uh, discussions about uh, what it meant to have uh, you know include cloud services. So uh, well worth the reading. So enabling computer and information science and engineering research and education in the cloud and then the future of cloud for academic research computing. So that's all I have. I'm, uh, I'm Alex Peltis, I'm at Clemson University. I'm a genetics uh, and biochemistry department. A professor there, I, I'm like a, a bioinformaticist, I guess, is a, another term that I, I am. I am. Uh, but primarily, I guess, for this, this group, I'm an engaged researcher, and I train engaged researchers in how to use, use these systems because they're really important to, to my work. Um, so I just want to give a little talk about Again, this, I'll talk from an engaged researcher perspective a little bit about this NSF CC Star project that we have um, to be able to just distribute a cloud computing and uh, and be available to always give my perspective on uh, what it's like to be a, from a researcher perspective. 
Uh, my lab is very diverse. We're very interested in plants and animals. We're doing a lot of work right now in kidney cancer and intellectual disability, looking for genes controlling these traits. Um, we're also interested in root nodulation and how plants can fix nitrogen from the air. Um, to do a lot of this work, we have to do, uh, use high performance, we have to use a lot of clock cycles from lots of different systems. We do redneck parallel computing, we do uh, pro proper parallel computing, we grab GPUs, we scavenge whatever resources we can to be able to get our work done. Um, because we're working at a, a very high, uh, we have a lot of data that we wanna, wanna, wanna crunch. What's happening in biology, and this has been a theme, I guess, in, in this meeting and lots of meetings like this, um, is that data intensive computing is a real thing. Um, it's hitting people that used to do computing on their laptop, they no longer can fit the data on their laptop, laptop let alone compute it, and so they're having to deal with uh, how to process all this data. This is a, a chart that's already been shown where sequencing DNA now is very cheap. Uh, 23andMe will sequence your genome at a fragmented level. They had a sale like last Christmas for like, a, I think it was like 50 bucks or 100 bucks or something like that. So it's very cheap to get your genome sequenced. And what's happened is this microscope into the, the molecular structure of the organism is generating massive amounts of data. There's one uh, re data repository at the National Center for Biotechnology Information that has, now has 19.4 quadrillion base pairs in it. Um, that's growing, it's exponential growth. Um, there's no end in sight. It's actually gotten so bad that this place, uh, NCBI, was, has been great. They've been storing sequence data since the 80s. And uh, now they're, they're not able to store everything. And they used to mirror it with Japan and with the UK. And now people are starting to fragment what they're able to actually store. Um, this is just one, one database. There's lots of data, uh, data sets floating around. Some of you probably hosted them, if not um, generated some of them uh, across the country. And so what's happening now, like from a medical record perspective, you know, it used to be you go to the doctor and they get a little vanilla folder out and write down your cholesterol score. Well, now you have, you know, a thir 30 times 3 gigabytes of, of data for your genome that doesn't fit into a, a, a manila uh, a folder anymore. Um, and so we're having to, act, 23andMe is a great example of that. You sequence your, your DNA and they keep it, um, you know, on, on their servers, in their cloud, whatever it might, wherever it might be. And this is becoming more and more common. There's plenty of hospital systems now that are actually sequencing every person's DNA. Um, and they're, they're putting this somewhere for people to access. I've, been, I've accessed free data sets, I've been trying to access secure data sets. There's data sets all over the place that are incredibly powerful for mining uh, for different, different reasons. Um, and here's just like an example, I think, of, of the, the near future here. Um, I, I could see a commercial collaboration between things, places like AWS, um, Hosting, hosting your genome, Internet 2, transferring the data between um, servers, maybe, oh, this is not working, um, at CVS, they're trying to get a prescription filled. They don't want to just give you the standard dose that they've always given you. They want to give you a personalized medicine dose. Um, they use to access your data from 23andMe to be able to decide what it's going to be, you know, at the pharmacy level. I could see this kind of thing happening. I could even see with DNA sequencers getting cheap enough, you get a CVS to get your genome sequenced if you haven't already done so, and then it gets uploaded into the cloud. And so I see exabytes and exabytes and exabytes of data being generated in research labs and also um, in commercial endeavors. So to be able to deal with all this data, I'm always trying to, to scavenge um, new, new ways to process my data. At Clemson, we have a condominium model cluster. It's really great, it's fantastic. I've outgrown it. Um, I use the open science grid. We processed almost a, a, a millennium, like a thousand years of CPU all time, which is like geek awesome, um, last, in the last year. Um, and we've, I keep scaling up trying to, pro, trying to analyze my data sets. And I see myself as being kind of a normal person, a normal research, biological researcher in a few years. And it's normal for a lot of people right now, but I could see you know, individual investigators at lots of institutions needing this kind of uh, 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 data processing. So um, this led to, uh, we, I was able to get a CC Star grant with RINC at UNC at Chapel Hill and Washington State University in a collaboration to be able to build a distributed cloud system. And the grant is called Scientific Data Analysis at Scale, CIDAS. Um, and what this really is, is a way to, to build, the, the, a lot of the, build in a lot of the middleware infrastructure needed to be able to do distributed cloud computing. But it's focused on the researcher, which is, Part of what I'm, what I'm trying to do, there's other researchers on the grant, we're embedded in the process, and um, the user-facing side of this is being able to build, build command line interfaces that are, um, are familiar to people, using schedulers they're used to, like Slurm and, and PBS, but also, um, does this thing work? Uh, this, there's databases of or, or a hydrology, hydrologist, the hydrology community, access a lot of their data through this HydroShare database. A lot of non-human biologists 
um, you access a lot of data like plant data and crop, crop genomic data through this triple, T-R-I-P-A-L database. Um, so these are like familiar places for people to go and get their data and we're trying to soup it up. We've already souped it up with another DIPS proposal um, and with SIDAS to be able to give more uh, access to workflows for, for, the, for the user. Um, this is just an overview of what SIDAS is. You can see at the top um, that we're integrating things that people are using, like we use and other people do. Um, like Next, uh, Nextflow and Pegasus workflow managers are built in. That comes from me using the open science grid um, to be able to uh, do a lot of the work the way I do it. Um, and we can basically recreate the open science grid um, in a distributed cloud environment. Um, but, and also we have, everything's containerized. We have, we're, a lot of what we're doing is Docker-based um, right now. And we have Slurm and HD Condor schedulers built into our system. Um, and so what's happening though is that when we, the user accesses this, tell them from the user perspective, um, what's going on behind the scenes, um, the, there's a lot of network aware, aware software inside of our, our, um, our appliances that we build. And we've actually successfully been able to launch through an Apache Mesos cluster, be able to put our SIDOS environment inside these Mesos clusters distributed across commercial clouds like Azure, and we used AWS and also Cloud Lab and, uh, and Chameleon uh, NSF clouds. All this revolves around moving data in and out of a, a data grid, which was a pretty new concept for me. I knew what it was, but I didn't realize how incredibly important it is. Um, we were using iRods as our data grid system. And um, next to where we have our iRod storage, we have about 4.2 petabytes distributed between Pullman, Washington, Clemson, and uh, Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina. And we've built, we've put the, our Fiona boxes um, near these resources. So this is a way to sort of interface with, with the PRP. Um, and so, uh, whoever stop me if, I, if there's time. Um, three minutes, okay, I'll just go real fast. So basically the concept here from a user perspective is we create these Psy apps. And what this is a Jupyter Notebook Psy app, where this is what um, you need to have a, a Python script or something spit out is this JSON file that des describes where the iRod system is, what containers you want, and be able to allocate um, resources within the Mesos cluster that we have. So you can have worker nodes and, and all that that you need to be able to get work done. Um, we'd love to be able to integrate this with Kubernetes, be able to go out into uh, uh, PRP, if not inside of our SIDAS environment, actually be able to, to get jobs to go out. We have the ability to flock out to the Open Science Grid. Thank you, Open Science Grid, Frank and company, whoever's here, um, for helping us do that. It's been really, really successful. Um, since I don't have much time, um, this is uh, one thing I wanted to say that, again, we're, we're supporting for the, pro the project is the hydrology and, and biology communities. Again, typically non-medical non biologists, which is a whole big, you know, industry filled with lots and lots of different communities. Um, but this is, uh, we've our PRP dashboard that, that's been great, um, or NRP, whatever we're supposed to call it now, um, where we've got, I've got Clemson and, um, what do I have there? WSU, uh, Pullman, Washington, our DTNs hooked up on the dashboard. This just got, we just put the new, the new log scraping software in here and, you know, I guess things are still being optimized so it's not ult ultimate throughput. Um, but this is what's great about it, right, is that you can see there's a problem. There's the disk to disk through throughput is not what you need, it's not optimized and we need to be able to um, optimize that. What I'd like to do is that these triple databases that we are, support, and these are developed by people that are on the project, it's about a 10 de decade old uh, uh, open source project that is supporting many, many different uh, communities of, uh, from people who study trees and beans and lots of different crops and be able to have them have D DTNs and have access to data of intensive computing at the DTN level and machine learning at the, at the edge. Um, so the triple databases are access points for thousands of researchers. Many of them have no idea how to do, use a command line. Um, and that's part of the job of a lot of people on the grant and people I collaborate with of teaching people how to do basic, you know, be Linux enabled, be able to run workflows and write, write basic Python um, scripts and things like that. Um, so this is just a, a few things. I'll just, I'll leave this up here um, if we have time to talk about things, but just some ideas about, um, from my, my perspective on the cloud, um, one of the big things, num number one there is the exascale genomics, which is Im Im impending. The doom, doom is nigh. Um, to have this happen and be able to get like sick kids out of bed, be able to develop crops quick, quickly in changing climates, we have to have commercial clouds. We have to have things like the NRP. We have to be able to distill data like was talked earlier, be able to not just process everything in a brute force way. Um, and there's some other, other um, aspects there too. Um, one, one last thing here, I'll, I'll shout out really for the NSF clouds have been um, invaluable for us to be able to test a lot of these systems out. 
I wish there was a little more resources on there where we could actually do some computing, um, but it's, it's been, a, been a great, great thing. And this is uh, the group of people that are involved in, in this and some other projects. All right, so I, I was told that we, we have time for one question, and I, I promised Jim that uh, I was going to let everybody know that he's in charge of this afternoon session, and he's the, he's the yeah, for timing, so uh, he's, he's the, so pay attention to him. <laughs> so anyway, we have time for one question. So, so, so the way we're, we're approaching it is, um, that, that's why we're coupling our services together so that they, they can have the choice of using their free credits or, or not. Um, but as far as, um, you know, I, I think most researchers at, at our university realize that at some point they're going to have to pay or the department's going to have to pay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, this is something that, that we have to think about. But What's that? Well, we, so, so our, our environment's a community-owned environment, so, you know, we do have free access, but, you know, you can be preempted at any time, and so there are incentives built into the environment to um, to um, to get people to thinking about you know maybe we should invest in this, and, and and as far as the cloud services, you know we don't buy them ourselves and give it to the research community. We see it as a research community uh, or a group comes to us. Turns out that our condo model doesn't really make sense for them because they only need it, you know, every so often. So it, it just, um, you know, they don't want to buy into our environment, knowing that really all the free cycles are being, you know, they're paying for others to use their system. So, um, so it's easy for us to work with them, set up the cloud resources. You know, they've got a departmental credit card. It doesn't come out of our budget; it's their budget. So, I mean, that's that's kind of how we're handling it now. Yeah, I, I I need to pay for it, but I don't know how much I need to put into into my budget. Because half, like, if I'm doing ten percent of my experiments are successful, I'm like, this is like the best week of my life. Is there's never everything's always failing, so I can't budget in all that. The, you know, the buffer of failed experiments, I have no idea, and that's part of what we're trying to do with SciDos actually is we're actually writing some code to be able to predict how long it will take and what the resources we need within the SciDos environment, but that also could you know expand out into you know, how much I need to write into grants. I could do a simulation before I write my grant for the experiments I want to do. But I think I should pay for it, and I think my university should pay for it. I think we should be splitting the cost. So. Can we thank uh, Barr and Alex again?